Hi, I'm Jordan Chung. I'm Tom Pearson. I composed Concertino. And I helped edit the video up on YouTube of Concertino. A funny story. While we were editing, um, I had the idea of doing something like a director's commentary, like you'd find on a DVD that you'd rent from the video store many years ago. And I thought it would be funny if we took that approach uh, with Tom's piece. Uh, I've always enjoyed com uh, director's commentaries and uh, the same kind of blow-by-blow -blow reactions occur for a composer when he's listening to his music. So Jordan suggested we do it and we are. <laughs> This was a really nice event for me. Uh, the goal of the event was the little Mozart A major concerto, which is available on another one of Jordan's YouTube creations. And suddenly I got the inspiration to write something for it. Uh, I'd never written for this particular combination of instruments before, but the idea of having players there available to play, I, I just kind of got excited. Um, one unusual aspect was that I usually write very slowly now in my old age, but because we had a deadline and a concert schedule, this particular work just kind of poured out of me. Uh, that in itself was an interesting experience, and I hope that I've learned from it in order to apply it to my more uh, rigorous, uh, uh, slow writing. Anyway, the piece starts with an improvisation over a pedal. Um, of course, that made the job of composing a little smoother. I didn't have to <laughs> write out this piano part. Um, maybe some of you know that uh, the concertos of 200 and 300 years ago, the players often were uh, improvising to a certain extent, especially during the part called the cadenza. Um, now the cadenzas are sort of fixed, uh, but in Mozart's day and in Beethoven's day, the players improvised that part. This little concertino, the entire piano part, is extemporized. Starting with a very simple idea, just a rhythmic pedal. Uh, when I went to the first rehearsal, I was wondering, do I need to add a, per a percussionist or a drummer to this? and the string players were able to generate a groove and it wasn't necessary. First moment of contrast. I always like my contrasts to be very extreme. So went from you know, low register pounding bass to a smoother chordal melody. It was important that the background structure be somewhat simple. Uh, so I was repeating the or orchestra things uh, in a simpler way than I often do in my uh, other works. Oh, this is one of my favorite types of things to do. It's what I call a close canon. Uh, There are actually three parts playing the same melody, one immediately after the next, and it makes a kind of thickness that I enjoy. <laughs> I get a smile on my face when I watch the players. They were really fun to work with, and everybody gave 100%. Uh, playing brand new music is a different challenge Usually players are called upon to play 
things that have been performed hundreds or thousands of times. But here we're doing something that had never been played. <laughs> this is another one of my favored textures, the idea of the double attacks in the strings. Gee, that guy needs a hair transplant. <laughs> anyway. One thing that I felt when I was playing was I used to teach composition. And often I would teach from the piano. And it was easy to demonstrate to my students the direction their music could go. And here, since the written parts are really only 50% of what the goal is, I'm somewhat fulfilling the same function by taking the music into different places by what I add to it. We had one shot at this on the day, and we were lucky it, it, it worked out. Um, I even played some things that I wouldn't necessarily have thought to play. Uh, now we're back to the opening material, the low repeating bass. It is developed a little bit here from a steady tonality into a kind of melody that repeats. Sorry, I don't want to get too preoccupied just listening <laughs> to what we did. It was an interesting challenge to get these classical string players to try to groove a little bit. I found myself constantly saying, it's rock and roll, it's rock and roll. And yet the impulse of classical players to make things smooth and refined is so deep. You kind of have to drag them out of that to get them to just play like jazz musicians or, or rock musicians. This is the return of that first chordal theme, this time with the, the bass, the bass uh, added. When I was a kid, my mother used to tell me, don't make faces while you play. But it's hopeless. I'm 70 years old and I'm still making faces. And I remember this was interesting composing. Usually at a moment like that, I spend a lot of energy for the various transpositions. In other words, am I hitting the right chord at that moment, the climactic moment? You know, an A or a B flat or a B. I usually go through all 12. But I got to that place when I was writing this and hit that chord and somehow I thought, this is it, and just went ahead. And I think that somehow generated this long descending passage. Then we bring back the bass theme once again at, at the end of, of, of the descending chords. There it is. And now we have the close cannon that we heard once before. Now this is a passage that I also think I could not have written if I wasn't writing quickly. 
Uh, when I'm riding slowly, I just don't want to go off the tracks. But for an improvisation, you're often going off the tracks. And many great compo composers composed in an improvisatory way. Beethoven, for example, or Mahler. And I think where this kind of becomes this mulling around. I don't think I would have written that if I'd been written in my usual careful way. Now we have the double strings again. And Jordan did a great thing with the editing to put a button on the end of this movement. So Tom, you mentioned that you were working under a tight deadline and that you were forced to make some maybe different creative decisions that you usually might be hesitant to make. Can you further talk about that? Well, it's not so much a specific decision. It's the whole process is happening at a different rhythm as you, you know uh, of course the music is in real time but the process of creating the music in a sense is in another real time even though that real time is you know a hundred times longer than the real time of the composition itself so uh, when I write slowly I take a lot of time to make decisions and I explore many options but working under a deadline which was of course the way I used to write film music the recording session is set for Friday and the music has got to be done so uh, you're winging it more it, it turns into more of an improvisation which is not necessarily a bad thing you mentioned something about um, making faces and your mom would comment on that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I just oh, wanted man. to say that personally, when I watch you play, I really enjoy those moments. And I think that that's, um, you know, a great expression of how you're feeling and how you're playing the music at the time. And I really look forward to those facial expressions. Oh, because I'm glad to hear that. You know, when you, I'm not, I don't go to a lot of classical concerts, but I, everyone has an image of it being very stiff and uptight but when you have that approach and you see the musicians and composers acting that way it kind of breaks down a barrier that a lot of people might have about classical music i i understand what you're saying and uh the main problem with having to worry about what your face is doing is you're trying to worry about other things that you're doing you don't need the extra burden of juggling while you're sprinting 100 meters you know um, so, uh, but I still feel a little self-conscious when I see myself on camera. Someone once told me that they thought this melody sounded kind of Japanese. Uh, that really wasn't my intention, I, I wonder. Um, I, I like to function in a fairly complex harmonic style, and I find that it's very important to have bold melodic or bold harmonic statements in order to orient the listener within a more extended chromatic style. This was a very special problem. You see the flute player, uh, Mr. Shirasaki, uh, conducting. I couldn't conduct because I was playing the lead part of the, the, the piano there. And so he took over that responsibility. And there was another problem these chords change very slowly and when I'm improvising I'm not really counting so you probably can't see it but the first violinist is giving me a little nod every time the chord changes so 
among the three of us, we were able to coordinate things successfully. Most people don't know it, but in the era of Mozart and Beethoven, the responsibilities for leading the orchestra were divided between two people, the first violinist and the composer, who was usually at the keyboard. You could see the first violinist over there to the right gave me the little indication of the chord changing. The orchestra here is playing what's called a cluster, which means many notes grouped together. But it's not a noise cluster. It's a diatonic or tonal cluster, which is actually more difficult to play in tune than a noise cluster. Noise, you don't need to play exactly in tune. But this is supposed to be, she gave me her cue. Uh, these sounds uh, need to be very carefully played in tune. And because it's not just do mi sol, it's do re mi fa sol la si all together, it was a little tough to work that out. Of course, I'm a, uh, often uh, improvising in the context of jazz, uh, which has its own harmonic language. Uh, I didn't want any of this to really sound like jazz, but of course, uh, there's no denying what's in your background. So the movement of some of these harmonies and even the harmonies themselves are somewhat jazz-like. <laughs> I wanted to be a classical player when I was young although the demand of playing exactly the same notes, no matter what the condition of your hands, uh, was too much for me. So one of the great things about improvising is whatever the conditions of your hands are, that's what you play. Um, I've had classical players tell me, oh, it must be so difficult to come up with stuff to play in an improvisation. And I say, are you kidding? It's a hell of a lot easier than playing a Chopin etude. <laughs> now, I've heard directors in their director's commentary point out little flaws in what happened. So there's one coming up where if we ever do this piece again, I'll probably make a revision. So the music builds to this climax, and now a dissonant part, which is going to lead into a low A pedal. Now, the section following that A pedal, which I wanted to sort of sustain the energy, but I think from here, I think I didn't handle this quite right. Or maybe I should be playing something differently at the piano. Uh, I could have taken the approach of playing a real bravura cadenza that was, you know, I think that would have fit better. Uh, but anyway, that's something that is not quite what I'd hoped. this climax and I'm playing the bridge now this is going to lead back into what is called the recapitulation that opening flute melody Now, I almost wish that I'd completely stopped playing the piano for these melodies. At the beginning of the piece, it was the flute alone. Now we have the same melody transposed from the flute to what comes next. Is it the oboe or clarinet? Don't remember my own music. Um, oh, it's clarinet. And I'm backing with the piano, but I almost think it would have been nicer just to leave these melodies completely 
alone. That's a way I often develop something. In other words, fragment it and transpose it. So this is basically the same melody as the flute played at the beginning, but in different keys. It's tough to play that in tune on a string instrument. And final statement, the bass has it. Then we go into the little coda, which is one of my favorite parts of the piece. I'll, I'll tell you when it comes. I just happen to like the harmony that I wrote. This part. It's just two harmonic parts over an A flat pedal as a back, backing for an improvisation. I just like the moody feeling of it. This sound has a lot of intensity for me. And of course, when the backing has intensity, it will inspire the improvisation. And I like what I played with this. I thought this work could be orchestrated for a slightly larger ensemble. Um, it could be done. There are no brass here. And the movement comes to a close. Tom, you've worked with musicians from all around the world. Can you briefly comment on what it's like to work with Japanese musicians? Well, I, I always hate to make stereotypical descriptions. One thing I will say, though, about being in Tokyo, having previously been in New York and Los Angeles, is it's a huge city, so the grassroots of a freelance thing, like freelance musicians, is, is tremendous. And if you look hard, you can find wonderful players who are not famous, who are not particularly expensive, whatever. And I didn't really know what to expect with this concertino because my connections for classical players are not nearly as good as my connections for jazz players. But uh, Ms. Nakamura uh, found these players for me and I was very, very happy with them and enjoyed working with them tremendously. I will say one thing about, uh, I guess it's kind of a stereotype. Uh, I, I found that the players here are very calm in rehearsal and really concentrating on getting the job done. <laughs> when I went back and recorded my big band in New York with the New York studio musician stars, man, it was like wild beasts in a you know, in a confined area, man, it was a shock to me, actually. And I had difficulty, like, getting into the other frame of mind. Um, but I loved working with these players, and when we recorded this commentary today, I found myself looking back on this event with a lot of feeling. Tom, you had mentioned in your commentary that you had some jazz, in obviously you have a jazz background, um, and some of those influences of jazz might have ended up in this piece or other classical pieces that you've written. Yeah, um, 
Although I have to say that one of the nicest compliments I ever received was that somebody said that whether my music was jazz or classical, it all sounded like the same guy. Mm. Uh, and I, I've thought that the different genres in music, which were so eager to separate into categories, in fact, the, the real lesson is that each genre teaches something basic about the basic laws of music, which to me, melody, harmony, rhythm, and form. That's pretty much it. And it applies to country songs, it applies to traditional Chinese opera, it, it applies to symphonies, and it applies to all music. So can you personally hear, or are you consciously inserting these kind of jazz influences? No, I never consciously no. insert. No. But the, the lesson of jazz uh, for modern music is you want the shit to sound good. Mm. <laughs> uh, a lot of modern classical music, the composer gets very preoccupied with something he wants to do and forgets about the basic communicative sound of the music. That doesn't happen so much in jazz. And jazz, even modern jazz harmony, has evolved with a basis of, it's gotta sound good. Mm. So, uh, as dissonant as my music can get, basically I, I want it all to sound good. None of it's supposed to sound like noise. Uh, of course, people have their taste about how much dissonance they enjoy in music. I, I compare it to spice in food. My, my mother couldn't stand any spicy food at all. Whereas I like not the most spicy food, but I like it pretty far up there, 60 or 70 percent. So dissonance in music for me is analogous to that. Um, basically though, I think any composer or jazz musician uh, writes or plays the sounds he wants to hear. Right. And that's really the fundamental artistic statement. I believe in these sounds. These sounds are what I think is beautiful. Cool. Um, we've talked in conversation about the relationship that you have with the musicians that play your music. Do you want to comment on how these musicians in particular, um, the relationship you had with them? Well. I was very happy that they were so giving. Uh, we added an extra rehearsal because we originally we didn't plan to have the concertino and that's a, it takes a lot of rehearsal to put together a new piece. Uh, but they all gave a hundred percent, man, and that's very moving to a composer. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I. I, I I really enjoyed it. Now that I'm retired and I don't collaborate as much as I used to, that's the one part I miss, uh, putting music together with, with, with other musicians. It's a special kind of a fellowship or bonding or I don't know what to describe it. But. Right. And finally, you've been living in Japan for a very long time. Do you see or hear those influences of living in Japan come out in your music? I'm sure that they do. The, the most striking change of location that came out in my music was when I moved from New York to LA. Mm. And it, again, those things are not conscious, but a, a city has a rhythm and those rhythms infect your music, whether you like it or not. Uh, and in a sense, the more sensitive you are, the, you know, the, the, the more those external rhythms will manifest. Um, so I, I'm considering a move to another country. I wonder if that will take my music in yet another direction. Classical conductors don't count off the music. But I have seen classical conductors that give a silent tapping on their chest for the tempo, that the players know what the tempo is going to be. I, I like this little 
jaunty theme. This little transition, I think that if I had been riding slowly, I, I might have made it a little more effective. Of course, when I'm riding slowly, the music can take a strange turn at any point, so maybe if I'd been riding slowly, it wouldn't have built back into the jaunty theme. And now the jaunty theme is a basis for a improvisation. I think the string players were quite on creating a groove here. Um, yeah, Tom, Mama wouldn't like those faces. <laughs> I needed to double these low string parts in the bass. And actually, I like to improvise or blow against a left hand that I'm playing. So, uh, and by this point, we're just kind of having fun. Brought in the upper strings there to sort of build the background a little bit. <laughs> When I look at these players' faces, I still see the classical, refined attitude, you know. In rehearsals, I'm saying, rock and roll, rock and roll. But I think they did create the necessary groove and definitely didn't need a percussion player. Actually, Stringed instruments are naturally very rhythmic because the act of changing the bow from up to down or down to up is, is, is a very rhythmic physical motion. And so, of course, within a single bow is a melodic smoothness. But when string players have to change the bow, it creates a, a definite rhythmic incisiveness. And coming out of the low bass, doing something a little bit similar as first movement, going into a melodic chordal orchestral thing. And I hope to think uh, that I wrote a fairly good tune for this. Now I played something here that I'd never played in rehearsal. I kept time in the low register. And I think that works really well and it will be hard to resist doing it kind of like that in future performances. But I'd never played that kind of a thing in, in rehearsal. I, I'd always sort of joined the, the orchestra in the upper register. And here we have the jaunty melody, and I use the close canon. First just oboe, now. And I'm playing the backing, actually. <laughs> and the bass with a little rhythmic counterpoint. Uh, I was interested that Jordan once told me he liked this part especially. And, okay, now we're back to the opening theme, but in a different key. I, as a composer, I, I place a lot of emphasis on getting the exact different keys. Like at a, at a moment like that, I took the time, even fast writing, to go through every key by ear. Like that too, the, the high woodwinds. 
I hope everyone feels that we're headed towards the, the climax at this point. An easy way to build something is just raise it up bit by bit, go into the upper register, and of course that's what this backing is doing. We're getting close enough to the end so that I want to acknowledge the players. Uh, Mr. Shirasaki on flute, Mr. Yamada on oboe, Ms. Mayano and Oishi on clarinets, Ms. Kanoshita on violin, Mr. Nishizaki on second violin, Ms. Ueno on viola, Mr. Yamaguchi on cello, Ms. Sonobe, our young bass player, and I also want to recognize Ms. Nakamura, who organized the players for me. And here we are, the end of the concertina.